Welcome to First Things First. We are back. I'm Jenna Wolf. That is the Hall of Famer, Chris Carter. This right here is Nick Wright. Welcome back, Jenna Wolf. We are rested. We are fresh. It's stop lying, Jenna. No, You're complaining down fresh. the hallway. I'm so tired. No, it's not what I said. <laughs> All right, have a But we are glad to be here, man. Last that night was are. wild. Yeah, no, no, listen. The NBA granted us an abundance of material today. Mm-hmm. NBA free agency got underway at 6 p.m. last night. Next and by air group. 6.01, we had headlines. Plenty of new faces and new places. And we're going to start right here in New York with the Brooklyn Nets. The Nets, who just two seasons ago were the laughing stock of the league, now boast arguably the highest stock in the league, reportedly landing two of the hottest free agents on the market in Kevin Durant. And Kyrie Irving, KD, will most likely sit out next season, rehabbing from his Achilles injury. But the Nets also reportedly get DeAndre Jordan as well. So good times in Brooklyn, my friends. See, I'll start with you. What was your reaction when you heard all of this go down? Very exciting. Very exciting. And I think one of the biggest winners in all of this was Kyrie. Kyrie was in Boston, basically his own team. Decides, I'm going to leave Boston, hoping he can get a better situation. Grew up rooting for the Nets. It talked about his dad, him and his dad have a very close relationship. I'm sure his dad had some influence on it. But I just believe you get to a certain point in your career, if you can choose where you want to go to work, and you can pick where you want to go to work, he likes the East Coast. He's from here. He's from Jersey. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I, w- I would have been shocked if he wouldn't have chose one of the New York teams. But in choosing the Nets, the Nets were able to win out, and not just because that's where he wanted to go, but he was able to convince Kevin Durant yep. that he can always have a sidekick over, over the length of his career, a sidekick in Kevin Durant to make Brooklyn one of the destinations. If you're going to watch an NBA game, and I've been very fortunate, we've been in the city the last couple years. I've seen a lot of Nets basketball games. They play an exciting brand of basketball. You got to um, take your hat off to Sean Marks, their general managers, in those three years there. When they hired him, they were the laughing stock. He has done tremendous things with a lack of draft resources. He's been able to find some players, develop some other players, deciding on the coach in Atkinson. That was a tremendous hire. He teaches a good brand of basketball. They have a great environment, work environment. Kustak's on the show. She always talks about how they treat the players, the camaraderie amongst the players. So this was the big upset in the Knicks not getting Kevin Durant and Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving convincing him to come to Brooklyn with him. And they let him off the hook easy so that with them taking less money, they could build a team around them really smart by the two of them. Obvious devastation for the team in the other borough of New York City, Manhattan, the New York Knicks. And I know we're going to focus more on the Knicks angle later, but you can't talk about this today without mentioning that. That for a year on this show and other shows, we have talked about Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving teaming up in New York City. And we got all that right. But I, as of two hours before the open of free agency, I was still, maybe I was the only one, convinced at the very least, even if Kyrie goes to Brooklyn, Durant's still going to go to New York. Mm -hmm. Durant had set up his businesses here in New York. The plan was the Knicks. And something went astray with that. And now Brooklyn, all of a sudden, after giving away the franchise in the KG Pierce trade, six years later, has the building blocks of, once Kevin Durant gets back healthy, a team that could dominate and all of a sudden very strong Eastern Conference for years to come. And, Nick, you weren't wrong by yourself. There was a lot of, even the Knicks. I mean, I talked to the Knicks about an hour before free agency broke, and they were like, we're out of it. And They had just found out. Yes. They had and, just and, found and, out. And, and, and it was shocking you know, to me and to them that they were going to be out of it. They were actually in Los Angeles when free agency opened. So even if Kevin Durant was going to have, in, um, you know, face-to-face meetings, they weren't even going to be here to be able to do that. The one thing we don't know, though, when you say something went astray with KD is whether that was on KD side or on the Knicks side, which you're hearing mm-hmm. stories from both sides, but that is something we do still have to work on. Right, and I know we're going to talk about the Knicks. Did they or yeah. did they not offer him the max deal? But they, the, the reality is Brooklyn saw this. This possibility. They saw it when they moved mm-hmm. Alan Crabb's contract, when after finally Sean Marks pulling them out of draft pick hell, 
Put them right back in it by trading away future picks to open up cap space. Cap space. All this cap space. The cap space the Lakers have but haven't been able to use yet. The Clippers have but haven't been able to use yet. The Knicks have but haven't been able to really use yet. They opened up believing this could happen. And this is instructive for anyone running a basketball team in a major market in this country. You know what's overrated? Young players, assets, and draft picks. You know what's underrated? Location, infrastructure, and money. Because Kyrie and KD wanted to play together. This is the era of super friends. LeBron got it kicked off a decade ago. We're now buttoning it up in 2019 with two friends saying, we want to play together. We want to play together in a cool city. And we want to do it where we both can get, even if we take a slight haircut, Mm -hmm. no pun intended, on the money. We, We are going to, we're going to make as much money as possible. And so... They did all of that in Brooklyn, and credit to the Nets, because they they gave them a viable option that wasn't the Jim Dolan run New York Knicks. All right, so on paper, CC, this is a great team with a ton of upside and two superstars, two and a half, if you will, well-coached, well-managed, all of it. But these are two guys with odd personalities coming together to play. We have to question maybe leadership skills there. And also, KD's not going to be playing next year. He's most likely, at least not in the regular season, going to mm-hmm. be rehabbing from that Achilles injury. So I ask you two questions. One, what is the ceiling for next year? And then what is the overall ceiling for this Nets season? Well, let's look at where they were before they acquired these two players. You talked about the inner structure. You talked about the coaching. You talked about the things that they already have. Who was the leader of their team last year? Hmm. Don't necessarily have just one leader. It's a team of a bunch of young, hungry players that are trying. The, the coaching staff has them going in the right direction. You can't even say D'Angelo Russell was the leader of that team. So they did it by committee. And so now when you inherit Kyrie and KD in free agency, we know who the leaders are. It's 13. It's 13, and collectively, I believe they'll put their thumbprint on it. Now, are there still some question marks as far as um, from a forward standpoint? You know, are they yep. are their forwards good enough? I believe they got enough shooting to be able to space to court, and Kyrie has proven, and KD has proven, and I believe that his game will be back very similar to the game. It won't be a 70% Kevin Durant. I believe it will be in the 95 percentile as far as the way he scores. They can score the basketball against anyone. So when they both get on the court and they both get healthy, healthy not next year, 1920, but 20 and 21, right. they will be a title contender. So correct. If the ceiling for next year is the Eastern Conference Finals, if all goes perfectly, unless Durant has a six to nine month recovery instead of 9 to 12 months, if Durant somehow comes back next season, then the ceiling is go to the NBA Finals, see what happens. But that's not realistic, and I wouldn't imagine KD, after suffering the injury he suffered, is going to rush himself back at the very beginning of a four-year contract, and I don't think the Nets would want him to do that. So it is about 2021, and then 21-22, and that is where there is an enormous responsibility on Kyrie Irving this season. Not about wins and losses. Yes, there is that. But it's about Kyrie Irving with Karis LeVert, with Spencer Dinwiddie, with Joe Harris, with Torian Prince. To be, because as you talk about all the time, it's tough to be a leader when you're not playing. It's tough to Mm -hmm. be a leader when you are rehabbing. Kyrie is going to be the de facto leader of this team. And it can't be that Kevin Durant, when he comes back, is coming back into a sl- even slightly toxic environment. It has to be the same good feelings they had this year, just with better success and more talent. If that happens, then a year from now, the Nets will go into next season, the season after this one, as the favorites in the Eastern Conference without seeing them play a game together because KD is that good. But that takes Kyrie's maturation. A lot that of takes Kyrie's there. health. That takes Kyrie learning from the bad experiences in Boston and not repeating those mistakes. I think Kevin Durant took a leadership role in even going to Brooklyn with the upset not going to the Knicks. So I do believe that, I know this, in a locker room, it's hard to lead when you're hurt. But when you're coming in as a free agent and you're changing the NBA structure, that leadership starts immediately. That's why they go out and and, and get um, the center. Oh, DeAndre and that's why, Jordan. And, and, and with Kevin Durant taking a little bit less, that shows leadership that I'm trying to build. I'm sure this young locker room, 
They have never played with a player like Kevin Durant. So I just believe it's not Kyrie lead until KD. No, this is KD's franchise. KD is going to be leading from the time he made the decision to join. And the we Nets. should mention Kyrie missed 56 games over the last two seasons oh, in yeah. Boston. It's like you said, very hard to lead. Uh, but the new look Nets hoping to be forced to be reckoned with in the East. Moving on now to Kawhi Leonard. The top free agent was rumored to be taking his talents to Los Angeles. And though many believe that to be the L.A. Clippers, the L.A. Lakers are now being seriously considered by the claw. According to friend of the show, Chris Broussard, the Kawhi to the Lakers rumblings are getting stronger and stronger. The reigning finals MVP reportedly had a conversation with Magic Johnson about the future of the team. CC, you have been on this from the very beginning. What do you know? What is the latest? What's the scoop, Chris? Well, well first of all, the Magic thing, Magic and Kawhi's group have communicated about them communicate, but them they have not talked. Magic and Kawhi have not talked to each other. So Ma Magic's talked to it was either agent or uncle or somebody, but not with Kawhi directly. No. And they've talked about talking, but that has not happened Got yet. It. And the reason why the Lakers are the team now that you're hearing more rumblings about is because most part people thought they were out of the picture. But when they were able to, able to get the cap space available and Kawhi, has put the Lakers on the list, and the Lakers have the most to prove in this because of the information. Who's running the team? There's, there's got to be some intimate conversation with Jenny Buss. That's been expressed to me. Jenny Buss can only answer a number of the questions that Kawhi and his team have. So the research that they have to do about the Lakers, it's going to take some time. But right now, there's going to be a lot of talk about it because the first two days of free agency, that being Monday and Tuesday, those will be the days they will sit down with the Lakers and the Clippers. And then after that, they will reconvene, get together, see where they are, see if one of those teams is leading or if they have, there's a favorite, and then they will go to Toronto and give Toronto a conversation about Kawhi's future. And the incumbent team always requests to have the last conversation, to have the closing argument, if you will, and Chris is reporting that Kawhi will extend that courtesy to Toronto because they have done everything right. There, there are a few points the LA Times is reporting that I want the audience to know about. One is that Kawhi's group was interested in a number of things. One, LeBron has his own personal trainer, Mike Mancius, that is works for the team. Will Kawhi be afforded that same opportunity? The LA Times is reporting he was told yes. He was. All, they also wanted to know, did you guys actually try to trade for Kawhi a year ago? They were told yes, but the Spurs wanted everything in the world. They clearly didn't really want to do a deal with us. That's why it didn't get done. So the Lakers, according to the LA Times, answered all of Kawhi's group's questions the way they wanted to hear it. And here's what I can tell you. The Lakers clearly believe not that they have a chance at Kawhi Leonard, that they have the best chance at Kawhi Leonard, which is why <laughs> they're letting all they have else stood by the up. wayside Everyone as D'Angelo Russell's a warrior, as Tobias Harris stays, as Jimmy Butler potentially goes to Miami, as Kyrie Irving goes to Brooklyn, as Chris Middleton stays, as Al Horford goes to Philly, as Malcolm Brogdon goes to Indy. You, the Lakers, it's a big gamble if they are, you don't get Kawhi. And it is, it is a gamble because he is the best player on the board. He is the reigning finals MVP. And for Kawhi Leonard, it is an absolute 180 from the position he was in last year. The position Kawhi Leonard was in around this time last year was totally powerless. He did not want to be where he was. He had a couple years left on his contract. He was helpless to, for, to go to pick his destination, and he no longer trusted the San Antonio Spurs, and they literally sent him out of the country. Kawhi Leonard now has this much power. If he picks the Raptors, they become at the very least, the favorites in the East, if not the favorites overall. It, and there are nine or ten teams that feel we can win a championship. If he picks the Clippers, they become a leading contender in the West and a contender for the championship. And there are nine or ten teams that believe they can win a championship. If he picks the Lakers, the Lakers are enormous favorites versus not any individual team, but versus the entire league and 
You, there are one or two teams that feel they can win the title. That is the type of power Kawhi Leonard has, and he's going to take his time, evidently, making this decision. I mean, it's no doubt the Lakers would be tremendous if Kawhi joins them, but how is this any different than, than what the Warriors did by just packing a bunch of superstars together knowing they're all going to be great? I mean, how good could this team be when you have those three tremendous guys playing, AD, well, it's LeBron, to and Kawhi? It's totally different than Golden State. Because Golden State was in a series actually with the player. Golden State already had a championship pedigree. Kevin Durant had the ability to be able to maybe end Golden State as we know him to be. But they end up losing that series. Kevin Durant decides that he's going to join them. This is not Kawhi's already a champion. LeBron's already a champion. They have already. And Kawhi's first choice was to go to the Lakers. Even if they didn't have LeBron. They, they would not trade him to the Lakers with San Antonio. But when he said trade me, it was to the Lakers. And then it was like, well, we might not be able to get you. He was like, well, trade me to L.A. People get that mixed up as if he didn't want to go to the Lakers or he didn't want to go to the Clippers. When he knew he couldn't go to the Lakers, he said trade me to Los Angeles. So this would be one of the best collection of the big three that we've ever seen. To me, I think they have more talent than the big three LeBron had in Miami. And if you look at the age of the players and now in the in the day of load management, to me, this would be the best three that we've ever had. And they'd be able to manage it because you wouldn't need all of them to play 70 games every year. So it is d very different from Golden State in how it would have been constructed and the history of the team. The Lakers, the worst record in the NBA over the last six years, as opposed to the Warriors who had won a title and won 73 games. Where it would be similar is you would have three of the ten best players in On basketball. One team in and, your starting lineup. Right. And, th and that is for the Warriors, led to back-to-back -back NBA championships. Where For the Lakers, this is why you do it. This is why you, you take the risk and you let all these guys go off the board knowing if we don't get him, we are going to be scrambling somewhat. The Lakers know that because he is that good. I would not, and I would not have expected the Lakers, let's say Kawhi was off the board and D'Angelo Russell was saying, I'm going to take until Thursday. I don't think the Lakers would have said, Okay, we'll just wait on you, D'Angelo Russell, even though he's one of the eight best players available this offseason. They would say, no, we've got to get moving. But the Lakers know if they get Kawhi, then everyone who doubted them and the process gets to be wrong and they get to be right. They get to have the best player in the world, LeBron James, or if you believe the best player in the world, Kawhi Leonard, with the second best, vice versa, and the best big man in the world, Anthony Davis. It would be not just a better big three than the one in Miami. It would be the best big three ever. It would be three, I said, of the top ten. I think three of the consensus seven best players in the world in LeBron, Kawhi Leonard, and Anthony Davis. Is that good for the league? Is that what the NBA is rooting for? Those are different questions. It's clearly what the Lakers are rooting for. And all of a sudden, because, by the way, while we were off, they opened up that max cap space. Rob Belinka showed. Mm -hmm. Maybe he knows a little bit more than we gave him credit for. They have the ability to make this a legitimate reality, which would be unbelievable if you consider where we were Midway through the playoffs, when the Lakers couldn't hire a coach, they had LeBron, they had these young players who hadn't proven themselves. To go from there to where they on the doorstep of would be unbelievable as far as that quick of a time. So time now for stories to start your morning. Sponsored by Gillette Clear Gel. So the Brooklyn Nets are reportedly landing two of the hottest free agents on the market in Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. KD will most likely sit out next season rehabbing from his Achilles injury. But the Nets also reportedly get DeAndre Jordan as well. All right, see, what was your reaction to all of this? Oh, this was a great piece. I mean, you need a, a big man and you need someone to protect the rim. Kevin Durant, we know he was underrated as a defender, but until he gets back on the court, especially with Kyrie, he's limited as a defender. Now he can play out on guards on the, on the court, forcing them into the middle where they have one of the best rim protectors in the league. Listen, DeAndre Jordan was the bonus that they didn't even need, but it's nice to have. KD and Kyrie, obviously the massive head. Headliners here. We had heard for a year 
Katie and Kyrie, despite how annoyed each of them would be when anyone would ask them about it. Uh, look at this. They ended up wanting to play together mm -hmm. in New York. I was dead wrong on which team it would be. I thought it would be the Knicks. They end up going to the Nets. The Nets, a year from today, will be the favorites in the Eastern Conference. Also, this is an important move because Joel Embiid's going to be in Philadelphia. And if you're going to have to win the East, you're going to have to deal with him. And last year in that series, he destroyed the Nets. Yeah, so Jared Allen's not big enough, so DeAndre helps there a ton. All right, moving on, the Celtics had a void to fill when Kyrie decided to leave, and Kemba Walker has been tagged to fill said void. Kemba has agreed to a four-year, $141 million deal with Boston. Nick, are the Celtics better off with Kemba? Instead of Kyrie? Absolutely not. But this is, I'm very happy, first, that Kimba got paid. I, I don't understand what they're doing in Charlotte, but that's another discussion for another Come day. Come on, you know what they're doing they're in just Charlotte. Being cheap, just being yes. cheap. Just not, Michael Jordan just will never go into the luxury nope. tax. Well, then trade Kimba a year early. But regardless, listen, Boston got a smaller, slightly worse version of Kyrie Irving. Now, Kyrie's a great player. Kimba's a very, very good player. So this is a coup for Boston because they could have been shut out. But the idea that they're better seeing Horford and Kyrie walk out the door and Kimba walk in the door, that would be foolishness. Yes, and there's no team in the NBA that would take Kimba over Kyrie. But now as far as the locker room, the ad in Kimba, is Kimba going to be a steadier force than him? Yes, but as a basketball player... Absolutely not. And it, while he might be a steadier force in the locker room, stylistically, a lot of the problems the young players had with Kyrie will show up with Kimba. Yes. Ball dominant, isolation, get my own shot. That's who Kimba is as well. So that's going to be on Brad Stevens to make yeah, that Yeah, Brad's got to make some adjustments. Yep. All right, let's move on to Clay Thompson now. The Splash brother took a step in the right direction to remain a warrior for life. Clay signed a five-year, $190 million max deal. Nick Smart for the Warriors to lock up Clay Thompson. Oh, there was a no-brainer. They absolutely had to do it. And they got Clay to agree, reportedly, to the same deal they got Steph to agree to, which is no player option and without a no-trade clause. So they gave him the max years, max money, but they have full control over those five years. Steph doesn't have either of those things. Now neither does Clay. But they had to do this. Clay kept his agent, kept releasing. See, if they don't offer me this, the first minute free agency, I could go here, I could go there. He was always staying with Golden State, and they were we're always paying. Yeah, absolutely. And with KD out already, the ownership new going into that new building, they need some star faces. And Clay has proven through the years, offensive end of the court, defensive end of the court, in the locker room, less problems than anyone else on that roster. They had to play Clay. He, this is well deserved money. Who was the best player for the Warriors game six of the finals? Clay Thompson. Look, a number of people thought that the Warriors dynasty would be done if KD was gone. Well, what did they do? Warriors went out and acted like a Top-rated organization reports are they are finalizing a sign-and-trade deal with the Nets to land all-star point guard D'Angelo Russell, a move that would send Andre Iguodala to Memphis. Nick, what do you make of the new-look Warriors come next season now? All those people that thought the dynasty was done are absolutely still correct. D'Angelo Russell, listen, credit to them for getting something for Kevin Durant. For when his, If he walked out mm -hmm. the door, wasn't going to open up any cap space. Yep. You got a legitimate all-star guard in D'Angelo Russell, and it should help them tread water next season until Clay gets back. Because I think Clay will play next year. Unlike Durant, I think Clay's going to come back. You don't miss a During full During the regular 12, season. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You don't miss a full 12 months typically with an ACL tear. So I think he'll be back. But that this move helps the Warriors compete for that 6-7 seed, and then when Clay gets back, be a tough out in the first round of the playoffs. But the Warriors, as we know them, are done. And trading away Andre Iguodala is part of, I mean, this is a cold world now, man. Yes. <laughs> I mean, not only trading him away, trading him to Memphis. Well, his but, comments last week about how he was misdiagnosed mm -hmm. and Kevin Durant might have been misdiagnosed because Iggy, he's, it's amazing when you win. People talk about his leadership, but he's a prickly guy. He says some strange things at strange times. So if people don't know... Andre Iguodala was on the breakfast club and said, listen, I had a stress fracture in my leg. The team kept calling it a bone bruise. He told everyone it was a bone bruise, misdiagnosed me. I don't know if those comments led to him being dealt or if he made those comments with information, I could be dealt. Like, I think that I think Iggy probably had the knowledge that if KD leaves, they're going to try to execute some type of sign and trade. And the only way to make that happen, he's the contract that would have to go out the door. So, listen, for the Warriors, they go into next season. Who's their front court? It's Draymond. 
I know they're going to try to keep Kevon Looney, but with this, there's cap implications. They're hard capped. I don't think they're going to be able to keep Looney. They have Alfonso McKinney. They have Damian Jones. Who else do they have? So the Warriors are going, they are better than they otherwise would be because they have D'Angelo Russell, but they're not a contender to win the conference, much less win a championship. And that's even when Clay gets healthy. And it allows them, Steph's going to play more off the ball. D'Angelo Russell's going to bring the ball up. And Steph is one of the best we've seen in the league through the playoffs as far as running off picks. But from a defensive standpoint, they are going to have a hell of a time staying with the guards in the Western Conference with Steph and D'Angelo both being challenged athletically and both not being great defenders. Do you agree with Nick that you see them more in that 6-7 spot right now? I'm not. I, Jenna, it, everything happened last night. I'm not getting in the seed and people. Nick's got the free agents <laughs> rated. Who's the best on the board? No, I'm not thinking about that right now. I believe they still are a playoff team, but a threat. To be able to win a title? Absolutely not. And what they also did by trading for Russell, and maybe it's the right move, is they had the opportunity to potentially, if they were a year from now, going to let Draymond walk, open up real cap space, and try to retool this team. Now they are locked in. Steph Curry's got... 40 million plus a year coming each of the next three years. Clay, we just heard, 35 million on average over the next five years. And they signed D'Angelo Russell to a deal that mm -hmm. averages 29 million. There's your salary cap. Right. They now once again have three max players, but Clay's coming off a torn ACL. And the other max guy, instead of being Kevin Durant, is D'Angelo Russell. And Steph yep. Curry, by the way, turns is 31 years old. So the Warriors, I they have a new building. It's a multi-billion dollars. They have a lot of people they need. Mm -hmm. They cannot go from where they were to 40 wins. So you make this move. But title contender, absolutely not. Dynasty is over? Oh, it's been over for about two weeks. Moving on to Kevin Durant, <laughs> the reason the dynasty is over. While many thought KD to the Knicks was all but a lock once free agency tipped off, many were wrong, including the Knicks. According to reports, the Knicks were not willing to offer Durant a full max contract as they had concerns about whether the 10-time All-Star would fully recover from his torn Achilles. President of the team, Steve Mills, had this to say. While we understand that some Knicks fans could be disappointed with tonight's news, we continue to be upbeat and confident in our plans to rebuild the Knicks to compete for championships in the future through both the draft and targeted free agents. Chris Carter, what was your reaction when you heard this? Man, you can't lose Kevin Durant. When the lottery balls and you lose Zion, you cannot lose Kevin Durant. Not for money. Not, <laughs> not, no. No, not when, not when Golden State. How much Golden State offer him? What? Five years, 221 million. Yeah, so we knew everyone else was going to offer the max. So you can't, you can't lose the job on arrival based on money. And I just felt from the beginning, knowing that Kevin Durant, his personal doctor, is also the team doctor for the Nets. He, so this is the second surgery. Um, Durant had a Jones fracture early in his career. He did the surgery when a couple other doctors did surgery where they weren't successful. And then now with the Achilles, he reattached the Achilles. So for me, as we saw with Kawhi, these guys, LeBron's got his own guy. These big guys, they want their doctor to be a part of the decision making as far as their careers go. Because all of them have guaranteed money. Yep. So with him being part of the staff with the Nets. I don't know how the Knicks even come up with the conversation because an Achilles injury is not the injury it was 20 years ago. With modern technology, with the rehab that they have, we have seen not the greatest of athletes in Boogie Cousins and others come back within 7 to 12 months. And we're, we're, see, where do the Knicks get off, with respect, thinking they are the smartest team in the league? And by that, I mean the Warriors offered him a full max. The Nets offered him a full max. The Clippers were ready to offer him a full max. The Knicks are the team that just knows better. They're the team that is, no, 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 we, we actually are wiser than these other teams. I get it. You got burnt by Antonio McDyke. No, I don't believe it was the team. I don't believe it was Steve Mills. And no, I don't believe it was their general manager. It's the owner. You think it was Dolan? 
Who, of, that's all it could be. Of, of course. That, and that's, <laughs> that's what I was leading to. I, because before those people were in place, Jim Dolan got burnt by McDice and then got burnt by Amari Stoudemire and then felt like you got burnt by Joe Kim Noah when you paid mm-hmm. big money to players with injured histories and maybe it's one of the reasons they were afraid those of committing. Those guys aren't Kevin Durant. No, of course they're not Kevin Durant. And I sat here on this show the day after they traded Chris Stapps Porzingis and, and, and yelled for anyone that would listen, defending that move because the plan was Kevin Durant. And I understand that Durant popping his Achilles threw a big wrench in that plan. And maybe Durant was going to change that plan on his own by picking someone different. You always knew that was possible. But for you to, it, it, if Jim Dolan made Steve Mills or Scott Perry, if this is true, and he told them, you cannot offer Kevin Durant the max, then you might as well offer him the minimum. There's no chance he's coming there for not the max. It's insulting to him Mm -hmm. when other people are offering him the max. But why do they think they know better? Why do they think they know better than the Warriors, who wasn't just five years 221? It was going to be another $600 million in luxury tax it was going to cost them. I don't, w- w- Jim Dolan, though, continues to be Jim Dolan. And so that's why. Wait, it, at do least you guys think that had the Knicks offered Kevin Durant the max, he'd be a Nick this morning? Yes. That was all the intel. Everything was leading to him with the Knicks. All this conversation, we didn't make this stuff up. Like, we knew he was coming to the East Coast, and everything pointed toward the Knicks. But the thing you have to realize, too, also in the report, it talks about the Knicks talking about the Max being contingent upon seeing the X-rays and seeing the procedure with Kevin Durant. Free agency was just open. They weren't allowed to be able to see the medicals until 6 o'clock. So Durant and them were like, we want the Max regardless of what it says, which if you have the history that the Knicks have, where you have been, hmm, you've missed on players, and you can't see the medicals? Because I don't know why Durant and them wouldn't just up with the medicals from the beginning. If it, everything worked out, everything checked out, I don't know why you wouldn't be just given. I don't know why you wouldn't be giving that to the Knicks. So this was a little confusing. At the 23rd hour, the Knicks were confused, too. I, the, the, Chris reported the Knicks thought they were in it until, I mean, you called me at 5 p.m. yesterday? Yes. 5 p.m. yesterday that you had been informed the Knicks were informed they were out of it. And so they thought they were potentially in it. I don't know if KD, even if they had offered him the max, would he have said, you know what, DeAndre, Kyrie, I can't convince those guys to come to Manhattan, so I'll just go with them in Brooklyn. Maybe that would have that sway would have been too much, and maybe the team doctor, may, maybe this all changed when he tore his Achilles because the team doctors in Brooklyn, because Mm -hmm. his own personal doctor, all those things. But I know this. The the Knicks have the benefit of the arena, the city, and a media that so badly wants them to be good, that has so many prominent members of the media, none happen to be on this show, but prominent members of the media that grew up diehard Knicks fans that Friends of ours, damn near in tears when the, when th- they don't get Zion, when things like this happen. They have so many things pulling in their direction. And then they have Jim Dolan constantly pulling the rug out from underneath them, just constantly undercutting what they can be. And it's, it's a damn shame because the franchise put itself in position to be a huge winner last night. And now I feel like everyone thinks they're a huge loser last night. I think in this new day, with these younger athletes, I think it's blown out of proportion. And I'm just going to make sure that I try to say this the right way. Younger players don't care about playing in Madison Square Garden. That's a dying breed. Kobe cared. Jordan cared. LeBron is a historian in the game. He cares a little bit more. But these guys don't care about playing in the garden. The lure of playing in Madison Square Garden is not what it used to be. It's not the pool that it had on other athletes. So, Playing in Brooklyn, I've been to Penny Games at the Garden and at the Barclays. Oh, they got a nice product at the Barclays. They got a good team on the court. So for me, I just think we need to stop thinking athletes are going to be drawn to one of these sports stories that, oh, man, I want to play at the Garden. Right now, playing at the Garden, what does it mean? It means nothing. And we've got to recognize that there is an enormous difference between the New Jersey Nets And the Brooklyn Nets. Yes. As far as the ability for players to have all the accoutrement, all the benefit 
of what a lot of people consider the greatest city in the world and not have to go like you can live here and play for Brooklyn. So people that don't live in New York City, people that are outside the city don't realize how close Brooklyn actually is to Mass Square. It's a subway ride. It's a it sub really it, it takes you 15 minutes yep. to get subway to get from MSG to Barclays. And so when it was the New Jersey Nets, it was different. But the one last point, you're not going to offer Kevin Durant 37 million dollars. Uh, the, the owner won't let you. But you offer Julius Randle and Bobby Portis a combined $37 million? That e either someone's, some, either they're not telling the truth or the person who made that call has lost their damn mind. I think it's more likely the latter than the former. Back here, first things first, we are joined by Yahoo senior NBA writer Vincent Goodwill. Well, Great to see, to see you, see Vincent. Good morning. good morning. When last we saw you, we had so many questions. Now we only have a couple of questions and a lot of answers. Let's talk Sixers. The Philadelphia 76ers might look a little different next season now. Philly reportedly shipping Jimmy Butler to the Miami Heat in a sign and trade deal. It's not done yet, but it is looking like it will be. The team will hold on to Tobias Harris, offering him a five-year, $180 million extension. And the Sixers will add five-time All-Star Al Horford on a four-year deal. So, Vincent, are the Sixers now better or worse after all these reported moves? They're certainly different. They are different. And I'm not sure if they're better because I think they found something in that playoff run where Jimmy Butler was their fourth quarter closer and it took a lot of pressure off of Ben Simmons. Now you're going into this season, this coming season, Tobias Harris is going to have to perform to this max contract. And Ben Simmons is going to have to have his game evolve rather quickly because there is no safety blanket in the form of Jimmy Butler. Jimmy Butler, I thought, fit the Philadelphia, the city of Philadelphia, with his ruggedness, with his take no prisoners attitude, sure. mm -hmm. in a way that I'm not sure any other player on that roster does. Al Horford is certainly an addition, but did you need an another big? In my, in my opinion, does he clog up the lane a little bit too much with Embiid? You certainly have a backup center if Embiid's back and his knees don't hold up. But you also have maybe Bam Adebayo from Miami once that sign and trade goes through. So do you have too much of something similar and not enough shot creation on the perimeter? I'm not sure. You have to wait and see how this looks. The way Philly is better after this deal, the only way they're better is if they are the number one defense in the league with a bullet. They have to be not a good defense, not a very good defense, a great defense that is a couple points per 100 possessions better than the second best defense in basketball. And they can be with this starting five now. When the smallest guy is Josh Richardson, when you're going 6'5", 6'7", 6'10", 6'10", 7'1", you and everyone's athletic except for Horford, you absolutely can be the best defense in basketball. Now, people are focusing understandably on Jimmy Butler's departure. The departure that they have to figure out how to make up for, because I think Tobias Harris can do a little more offensively, Al Horford obviously will help offensively, is J.J. Redick. There were times when you watched Philly last year when Redick went to the bench, everything ground to a halt. There were times where their best offense was a J.J. Redick pin down. He and Embiid action on the same side of the court. Where are you going to replace his shooting? Because Josh Richardson is a competent, above-average three-point shooter. He's not J.J. Redick. We know, even if Ben Simmons takes two steps next year, he ain't going to be no three-point shooter. Al Orford's a good three-point shooter for a big man. That doesn't make him a great three-point shooter in general. And so those are the real questions. But I do think Philly had to change something. And I think they had to put... The onus on Ben Simmons that you are going to have to be more than you were last year. And when we're losing two guards or two perimeter guys in Jimmy Butler and in J.J. Redick, that does put more of the onus on him. This team will go as far as he evolves because we know how good Embiid is. I feel like we know how good Horford is, and it's a benefit for them. They no longer have to go through Al Horford, who gives Joel Embiid trouble, but that's not why you sign a guy to this type of deal. The question is how much better will Ben Simmons get? Well, how much better is the East? Because if Kawhi Leonard happens to leave Toronto 
every team has gaping holes yep. in it. Milwaukee, we don't know what that finished product is going to, but we know they're not coming back as the same team. And I wouldn't say that they're the favorite to build a win the same number of games that they won last year. So every team that we look at in the East is going to be a little bit different. So we have to make sure that we have our expectations with the Sixers, just like the other teams, because it's a matter of can they get to the finals? That will be the question there. And a lot of that pressure, because I believe that Joel Embiid, after the playoffs and having some struggles in the playoffs with his health and things like that, I believe Joel Embiid will come back a lot better player. But I'm going to be consistent. I don't know what Ben Simmons is going to do. I haven't seen no videos this offseason of him trying to work on his shot. And you know the reason why? Because there's not good video out there. Because if there was anyone, Ben Simmons, or in his camp, if there was good video of him shooting the basketball, we'd be able to watch it every single day. So I'm going to let everyone else appropriate all their faith for what Ben is going to do. I have told you, the number one skill to hardest to improve is shooting the basketball. And we just shouldn't give anyone credit that they're going to increase their range from three feet to potentially outside of 10 feet. In one offseason. So then if shooting is such an issue, Vincent, why did the Sixers prioritize Tobias Harris over a guy like Jimmy Butler? Who they know, at least you saw it in the postseason, can come through for them. Well, that was the curious thing for me when I saw that they were offering him the full five-year max. And everything all the intel I had leading up until last night was that Philadelphia was going to offer Jimmy Butler the full five-year I don't think Jimmy Butler had an issue with being in Philadelphia. I think Jimmy Butler wanted to go somewhere where he was going to get paid fully. When he got traded from Chicago, one of the big reasons he was upset was because he knew he was out of the running for the Supermax contract that you can basically get only from the team that you're drafted with. The designated player. And, it, yeah. and, and that's when it went bad in Minnesota, too. When he submarined everything in Minnesota, it was when they made it clear we're not giving you the max contract. And so he, so Philly, Philly. Now listen, they got Tobias Harris just under the max. They saved ten million dollars over the life of the contract, but they almost the max. Tobias is a better three-point shooter than Jimmy. He's not a better closer than Jimmy. The question for Tobias Harris is: Every team he's been on, they love him, and then they move on from him. Like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, yeah. Everyone can't talk highly enough of him, but they trade him eventually. Philly committed to him. I think they overpaid for Tobias Harris. I think they had to. I think they understood we can't have traded what we traded away for Harris and then lose him after yeah. a year. And Philly's got to feel this way. See, man, what if Kawhi misses? Are we the champs? Like, we, were, we, we came closer to beating Toronto than anyone these whole playoffs. If Kawhi misses that shot and it goes to overtime, were we the champions? And so they should feel that they were close, but I understand them retooling. Yeah, I don't think that they felt like they had to make a choice between Tobias and Jimmy Butler. I think Jimmy Butler was leaving. And I think he was trying to play all the different strings, being Miami and Houston. But I don't believe Jimmy wanted to be back in Philadelphia. So to me, I don't believe they had a choice. So they were stuck with Tobias after the, the amount of things they gave up for him, knowing that Jimmy Butler was trying to leave. And he wanted to Miami me, for years. That yeah. seems like the move that he wants to make. A lot of this free agency is about where do you want to go to work? And I know Kawhi Leonard and his team, they're pitching that. I know Kevin Durant. It was one of the big questions. Where does he want to go to work? Where does he want to set up his empire? And that's what Jimmy Butler, and this was about, and I believe that the, that's all they had was Tobias and signing him. They had to bring him back. Well, you're, and you're probably right on that. But last year's playoff numbers, 15-9, and nine, that's good numbers for Tobias Harris. He's going to need to put up a lot better numbers yes. moving forward because now you have the specter of – it's no, no longer potential in Philadelphia. It's what you said. It's we are one shot away from possibly being champions, and that's the expectations well, they have going into listen, next season. Listen, if Tobias Harris is your fourth best player, you can win a title. If he's your second best player, you're in real trouble. The question is, if Embiid's the best, can Ben Simmons be in the top three and can Al Horford be in the top three with Tobias Harris? As, if he's your fourth best guy, who cares what you're paying? him you can go right. win the title if he has to be your second best player then you can't so that's about Horford and Simmons and Simmons getting better which I feel like are we in a time machine this is where we were a year the ago. exact same conversation we had a year but ago. see here, here's two things one it's not necessarily where Tobias ranks on if he's your best player fourth best player he needs to be someone that can get you a bucket 
four minutes Late or less yep. without running necessarily an offensive mm-hmm. play for him. Which you that, know Butler can do. That's what Jimmy Butler's strength was at. That's where he found gold, and that was able to take Ben Simmons off the ball. Secondly, Philadelphia has shown that they have a, they can go and get a player in the, in the middle of the season. Yep. They can assess what they need. So if they lack shooting, maybe that's something they'll address during sure. the trade before the trade deadline. Back here with Vincent Goodwill. The Brooklyn Nets just became the team to watch in the city to be, reportedly landing the services to the hottest free agents on the market in Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. They also got DeAndre Jordan as well. KD will most likely sit out next season rehabbing that Achilles injury, but still the Brooklyn Nets. All right, Vinny, what was your reaction to all this? Come Friday, I really wasn't that surprised. Friday night, you started hearing things Mm -hmm. that the Knicks were on the way out. And that not necessarily that the Nets were in, but that it was down to the Nets and Kevin Durant staying in Golden State. My feeling was that Kyrie Irving was a swing guy. He was the guy that KD not necessarily was going to follow, but KD wanted to play with Kyrie Irving. And he wanted to, wherever Kyrie was going to go, that was going to be where Kevin Durant was going to go. Now, whether that's because of KD's injury or KD wanting to be with his buddy, you know, who knows? And we'll sort of find that over the oh, next I think few days. We know. I think we know that it was because they they were planning this well before his injury. Yeah, yeah, but what, what I'm saying is who was leading? Did, oh, did, I got did, you. Did whether, rest... whether KD was going to pull him to the Knicks exactly. or Kyrie pulling him to the Nets, did that change when Kevin Durant tore his Achilles? That, that's, I got you. That's what I'm saying. So, and, and now I'm not sure if I'm put, putting the Nets at the top of the Eastern Conference because of where KD lies, but also – Kyrie Irving has some proving to do. We have to figure out if Kyrie was an issue in Boston or Boston was an issue in Boston. Him being the best player on a team full of young guys, he's going to have to be that this season with no Kevin Durant in the locker room or on the floor. And I know, and I know, CeCe, you've been around injured players. It's like they aren't there. So you can be part of the team. You can be on the roster mm-hmm. getting paid. But unless you're out there practicing playing, I wonder what Kevin Durant's influence is going to be while he's inactive. Yes, that part is true. But the different part is here is you're acquiring a player who is injured. You're also a guy who's going out of his way to change his career to come to your team. And they don't have a bunch of um, great players in Brooklyn. So they have a bunch of role players in the environment that they had in Brooklyn. This is Kevin Durant's team. I don't believe that we'll ever be able to be like this is Kyrie Irving's team. One is Kyrie's going to miss a lot of games. And if I'm spending money, I'm talking about hard or hardworking people, I would pay money to go watch Kevin Durant. Kyrie Irving, I'm not going to go to pay to watch because I've seen Kyrie Irving and you'll go watch him play and they'll be like, ah, you know, Kevin Durant puts on a show every single time. It's different when I've made all these moves to come to your organization. This is Kevin Durant's team. We can't think about this any other way. I don't care what you think about his leadership. I don't care what he's done in the past, but I believe that Kevin Durant was the turn in this. I know with the Knicks. The Knicks had this theory. Whoever Kevin Durant wants to play with, we will go out and get that player. Kyrie Irving was one of the players that the Knicks, that they were told that he wanted to be able to play with. And Kevin Durant, let this be told, he was not going anywhere where there was not a star player. So if there was a conflict between Kevin Durant wanted the Knicks and Kyrie wanted to go to the hometown and go to the Nets, then based on Dolan, him coming in, that swung it back over to him going because he was not interested in doing what Kawhi Leonard did. did it by, he was never going to do it by himself. And with, listen, we have known and, and been saying on this show for a year, and a KD and Kyrie got so mad anytime anyone would ask about it. That little conversation we showed a moment ago on in video hallway. in the hallway, Kyrie was asked about it, and he and he made it some some theoretical, philosophical discussion about what friendship is and what part of his life is private or not. Oh, you guys make this about free agency. I just can't. It was always about free agency. These two guys always wanted to play. Together Now, maybe Kyrie wasn't the only guy KD wanted to play with, but these yes. two guys always wanted to play together. And I the, here's what I believe. Because Marcus Thompson wrote a great article in The Athletic about – go ahead, Steve. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say they didn't always want to play together. 
Kevin Durant was intrigued with playing with Kyrie after the 2017 final. Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay, I shouldn't, by always, I meant all year. I didn't mean their whole careers. And they they, right. they became very close at the Olympics. They, they, they competed against each other in those finals. All, Kevin Durant went on Bill Simmons' podcast after the final and talked so much more glowingly about Kyrie's game than LeBron's game because of the skill associated with it all. He just things. said he was shocked. He said he was shocked at the player. He said he had maybe underestimated how good he was. So, correct. When I say always, a short version of always, this, this year this was the plan. And KD this year was always about the Knicks. And Kyrie, it would appear, had an eye on Brooklyn. If KD does not pop his Achilles, KD gets to be the stronger one in the mm-hmm. relationship. Mm-hmm. KD gets to be the one that say, we're going to my spot. Oh, listen now. Wait a second. Because if KD doesn't rupture his Achilles, the Knicks are going to wait on Kawhi, too. Sure. Now, they were going to have even more options because Kawhi, he would have been more intrigued with wherever Kevin, not to play with Kevin Durant, but it was just intriguing because he was going to look at New York and now with them deciding the Nets, that's off the board. So let me ask you this, Vince, and I asked these guys this a little bit earlier. KD wasn't the leader on that OKC team. Russ, you would say, was most likely the leader. And KD wasn't the leader on the Golden State team. Would you say Steph was the leader on I that team? I disagree with you on OKC entirely. I mean, okay. KD I mean, was I, clearly the leader of that team. Yeah. You thought KD was more yeah. the leader of Absolutely. that team? Absolutely. Russ got the criticism, but KD was... Russ was the strongest personality. Wait a second. Wait a second. I just... Why does it have to be one guy is the leader? Like, I, every team I've ever been on, there is more than one leader. It's a matter of who we give credit, who we give blame to. But for us to think that a team only has one leader, I don't even care if you have a LeBron team where you have different tiers. When he had Bosch and D-Wade, there's different types of leadership. So I just don't think that it was one person team. Both of those guys were leaders, and they did it in a different style. So my question was going to be, Kyrie hasn't proven either in Cleveland or in Boston that he could – successfully lead a team. I think he would even almost admit that. And I, whether you think KD or Russ was the leader in OKC, I'm just curious who jumps out to be the guy that's going to take over when this team has a bad day with a, a bunch of role players who are going to accompany them. That's the biggest question because if you look at KD and Kyrie's personality, their personalities are almost very similar in a way that they can be kind of flighty, kind of moody. I don't think either one of these dudes are bad dudes, but you do kind of have to worry about how much oxygen they're going to take up in a locker room when Kyrie is having one of his fortune cookie moments or KD is having one of his moments where he's not in the mood to be Kevin Durant face of the franchise type of guy. He put it like this. The way that I see Kyrie being an advantage to KD was this. The same type of skill as Stephen Curry without having the dominance in terms of the franchise and also being someone similar in age and interest that I can hang out and bond with. Stephen Curry was in a completely different position in his career and in his life. All those different things that Kyrie is not. Kyrie's a little bit younger. Kyrie's a little bit more, quote unquote, you know, worldly and everything else. He wants to hang out. They're into some of the same things. They're into some of the same things. So you're going, to, you're going to be more likely to bond. And that's the one thing that we know is very important to KD. They, they both took less money to fit DeAndre Jordan. To get who another played, friend there. Who yes. played for the Knicks last year. How bad do you have to feel if you're the Knicks and you acquired <laughs> DeAndre Jordan? Because of this. Because of this. So he can be your mole. Yes. And say all the good things that were going on, coaching staff, mm-hmm. front office, all that. And he says, nah, nah, guys, I'm let's go to Brooklyn. Yeah. The, to your question, Jenna, I, Nick Ferdell made this point yesterday, and I think it's a smart one, which is the concern other than about Kyrie's knee and Katie's Achilles and Katie, what he looks like when he comes back knee Achilles. Let's assume health, everything goes great. The concern is, and the, the analogy that Nick used was, you ever have your best friend in high school and then you go become roommates in college? That doesn't always go great. Some, and, and so Katie and Kyrie, whether it, they clearly are very close, what the concern is, because of the similarities in personality, when things don't go great, how do they deal with each other? We're not going to find that out next year, though. It's going to take a full year from a year and a half playing. from now, yeah. but once we're midway through the 2021 season when they're actually playing together. I, I actually, my, from eight years old, my best friend Dwight, we are best friends all through high school. We went to college together on a football scholarship. He was on the Ohio State team. So, yes, yeah, so at some point... It became this the question to Dwight. When are you going to grow up? 
And that's what these guys are going to, because they got their own team, they got their own city, and I just believe that they will do a better job than what we've seen other places. FS1 is your destination for the day's best sports shows. Hey, tune in. Big personalities, big stories. We get you started right here on First Things First. I got something different working. Jenna, you see what are I did? A delight. I, Super I went away today. for a couple You're days. A I came back. I changed my tone a little bit. Catch it on Monday through Friday only on FS1. All right, we're going to get to the new look Warriors with Vinny Goodwell in just a second. But first, a couple of big plays from yesterday. Big three, Jason Richardson with a big reverse slam. Former slam dunk champ showing he still got it. Oh, man, he got the bunnies now. Look how quick he gets up. That's Hops Vinny. Those are, he's got jumps. I used to have those. Oh, okay. Oh, you a lie. Used to have Bring those. a video tomorrow. Video or it ain't real. Used to have those, Vinny. Stop lying to America. Good job, Jason. Oh, I wasn't Richardson. trying to tell the truth. More business. <laughs> <laughs> Watch this. Dropping Welcome Mike Taylor with the oh. nasty sham god before making this a wide is... open layup. Ooh. He gave it a little pity pat with his left hand. I thought the man. I thought there was something wrong with the with the video. The, the video <laughs> skipped or something. Yes. Go get him. Will this Bynum. was so nasty. I didn't know Will Bynum wasn't in the league no more. Yeah. <laughs> the well, big three well, is thought, coming well, up now. Man, if Ricky Rubio can get 51 million, no one can split Will Bynum off with 5.1. I had I had Will Bottom. I'm gonna play. tell you what we're not gonna see. Entertaining we're not gonna see news, period, man. Lamar Odom highlights in the big three. Uh, Concacaf quarters. USA Curacao. American goalie Zach Steffen with an incredible save. Oh, upper 90 save. Oh, this was a tough one. Now he put it where he had to, and the keeper makes a great save. You know what that reminds me of? Vinny Goodwill with his hops. You know what I've been getting? <laughs> Look at him. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. Hey, that's what he was doing in Detroit coming up, playing soccer. <laughs> yeah, nine mile, eight mile, wherever he's from. Benny, reports yeah, are. three mile plus three more. The Warriors are finalizing a sign and trade with the Nets to land all-star point guard D'Angelo Russell, a move that would send Andre Iguodala to Memphis. Russell would be paired with Steph Curry and Clay Thompson. Thompson just signed a max deal to stay with the Warriors. All right, Vince, what are you making the new look Warriors now? Actually, uh, Chris, it's East 7 Mile, just to let you know. Oh, okay, that. no okay. problem. Oh, that's, that's no problem. oh you stand corrected. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But for the new look Warriors, yeah. ain't no champions. It's, di it's not a dynasty. Like an entertaining team, maybe. A flexible team in the future when, when Clay Thompson comes back. I don't think they necessarily signed D'Angelo Russell to trade him. I think they looked at it and said, hey, we just lost to a team that had a few guys in the perimeter who could create their own shot. The Van Fleets, the Kyle Lowry's, the Kawhi Leonard's. We're going to need as many shot creators as possible. You can't mm -hmm. lose a Kevin Durant and think you're champions. Remember, Chris, we had this conversation about whether Golden State needed Kevin Durant to be championship contenders. Mm -hmm. And I told the guy next to me mm -hmm. that he was a little bit off if they thought that oh, they yeah. could just, they just have... just dead, no. just without Kevin Durant. I, I'm just, They're what, just what, dead. what I said was... You can't ascribe any assumptions until you see what happens in the offseason, regardless of where Kevin Durant goes, because this league is topsy-turvy. And what happens now? The Golden State Warriors are, at best, a five or six seed. These championship windows are finite, and I think they're just close. They're going to be entertaining. They're going to be good, at least in the meantime. But they're not going to challenge for anything. Well, right. But the, the other thing that happened is Clay Thompson tore his ACL. And we don't have to relitigate that right now because Durant's a net and Clay Thompson's But if he don't tear his ACL, him. they don't sign him. No, uh, agreed, of course. And so, but l the Warriors with D'Angelo Russell, I get the move kind of because you were going to lose Kevin Durant for nothing, so get something. And you're right that maybe a year or two from now you flip him for something because assuming he continues on this trajectory, he, I mean, he made a legitimate all-star last year and he showed who he was as the number two pick coming out of Ohio State, even though it took him a few years to get to that point. And the Warriors did see in those finals when KD was out and Clay was out before Clay tore his ACL when he was out, when he missed the one game, or when, how impossible it was to run their offense when Steph is the only shooter on the court. The way teams would just box in one or triangle in two, anything they could to stop Steph Curry. They won't have to deal with that now next season. They will have a legitimate secondary option to Steph Curry. And when Klay Thompson comes back, they'll have a very interesting three-guard lineup to run out there. But no, there's not, they're not a contender. And in order to stay afloat next season, they did borrow from future Golden State Warriors. They borrowed from future potential flat 
cap flexibility if they're going to let Draymond's deal roll off. They borrowed that 2024 first round pick that we have no idea what that is going to be. So this was not cost free. And they reminded the whole world, no matter how much you talk about unity, no matter how much you win, man, this is a cold league. Andre Iguodala, thank you. You sacrificed. Thank you for coming here. Thank you for being the first big piece that led us to this dynastic run and winning a finals MVP. Go enjoy Memphis. We'll see you later. And Andre, it seems like Chris saw this coming with some comments he made in a radio interview week up leading during his book tour about them misdiagnosing an injury. But the Warriors are interesting next year. They are not contenders to make the conference finals, much less contenders to win a championship. D'Angelo Russell's a good player. His good story, and um, at 23 years, he is a good player to sign as far as moving forward. Not only as far as he's ascending, but also he has a contract that is not going to be an albatross around the team. He will be tradable. But to me, this is about entertainment, and it's about next year to be able to take the ball out of Steph's hand, move Steph to the two guard because Clay's not going to be playing, and allow Steph to still be effective, to still be one of the best players in the league. D'Angelo Russell, pick and roll, that's his thing. Can he get his shot? Can he get his shot at the end of games? Yes, he can. But from a defensive standpoint, Golden State, when they're not in the top ten defensively, they are in the middle of the pack as far as one of those seeds in the Western Conference. They, it's impossible for them to be an elite defending team with Steph and D'Angelo Russell being in the backcourt. Would this be a different conversation if Clay wasn't injured? Of course. Absolutely. Would they be title contenders going into no, this? I'm, no, I'm not, I'm not sure. Okay, I don't so think they would have signed them. I don't think they would have signed them. I, I, a, I don't think they would have signed them, and B, we lack the sort of comprehension to understand how big of a toll these championship runs take on teams. Not just physically, but emotionally and mentally on the team. That team was spent by the end of this particular playoff run. There were people who believed that that team was going to bow out in the second round before mm -hmm. Kevin Durant got hurt, and they sort of re-energized them and sort of gave them a second, a second life, so to speak, and then that sort of carried them to the finals. So even without... D'Angelo Russell, even without Clay Thompson's injury, I still, I'm still not sure that they would have had the fortitude, that they would have had the creativity, they would have had the personnel to truly challenge in the Western Conference, which looks like it's going to be just as tough, if not tougher, at the top with the Lakers and maybe with the Clippers right. if Kawhi Leonard goes there. I think it's very important to watch Draymond and see how Draymond reacts to being a middle-of-the-pack team in the Western Conference, being, are they going to treat me like Iggy, disregard me, ship me off somewhere, because... I don't believe they're going to be able to sign Draymond to a max contract. Well, that's the, so I mean, how does this end with them when they're not playing for championships? How does Draymond, the newest clutch sports client, I believe, how does he react to them not giving him a contract extension this summer? which I know he wants. I don't think they're going to give it to him. I mean, uh, Draymond, it would shock me if Draymond, if they were to offer him a contract extension and he turns it down. Draymond would love to be locked up right now. I don't see that coming. How does that play out in the future? For the Warriors, though, yeah, this is about they got a brand-new arena coming. Yep. They've been to five straight NBA Finals. And Vinny's point should not be overlooked. We act like the championship runs to only take a toll if you win the title. The Warriors played as many games last year. If they won the title, they didn't win the title. They win, the NBA Finals won six games. They played six in the second round. They played six in the first round. They, there's a long playoff run at the end of five years. They were going to need a year to take a breath anyway, but I just don't think they have the front court to compete. We wondered if D'Angelo Russell was a good enough third star if you had LeBron and Anthony Davis. Right. If it's Steph and Draymond Green with a rehabbing Klay Thompson, right. we know what that is. Back here, first things first, time now for your World Cup wake up. The U.S. took down host country France 2-1 on Friday. Amazing game. Two goals for Megan Rapino as the USA advanced to take on England in the semifinal tomorrow on Fox. Be prepared for a, the British lady to come out in that one. Nick, how impressive was this run been for the U.S. so far? Well, the U.S. has been great. France was the co-favorite, and they knocked mm -hmm. them off in France. But for Megan Rapino. With everything sitting on her shoulders, with all the pressure on her on and off the field, yep. to deliver the way she did, that is all-time sports history stuff, what she did in that game against France. I, It, it, was, it was stunning yeah. to see. Yeah, to me, I, I'm not going to say pressure, because if you follow her, 
This is what she's been about. She's an edge player. She's made statements and stuff before. She's a great player on the best team in the world. And the truth of the matter is, yes, we're cheering for the American team. But they got outplayed, especially in the second three quarters of the game. They got outplayed by France. But without her scoring, especially when they're locking down some of our other star players, she is a star among stars and was able to get us off to that great start. And we needed it because France, a quality team, they controlled the back half of the of the match really good stuff and now we move on to face England so that'll definitely be a tough challenge for them as well all right time now for some stories to start your morning sponsored by Gillette clear gel the Brooklyn Nets are reportedly landing two of the hottest free agents on the market and Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving KD will most likely sit out next season rehabbing that Achilles injury but the Nets also reportedly get DeAndre Jordan as well see what's your reaction to the new look Brooklyn Nets oh it's exciting it's exciting, the brand of basketball that they play. I got a lot of respect for Sean Marks. He's a guy that I got a chance to know when he was in Toronto. My brother was coaching the team. Sean was there. Butch gave him an opportunity to get his career started. He was in the San Antonio system. He has done a great job in three years. He is the big-time winner in all of free agency. He was able to do it. I know Utah, they made some impressive moves, but pulling these two big stars together and a couple other players are going to be able to add to a solid team I think was remarkable and for people under the age of call it 30 I think the team of New York City moving forward is Brooklyn and not the Knicks the Knicks have not won a title since 1973 mm -hmm. the Knicks have been in two NBA finals in my lifetime Brooklyn meanwhile has the Jay-Z partnership Brooklyn is the is the up-and-coming borough if you will hip -hop. They, right they've got the better <laughs> arena not hip hop no she, hip she was saying hip hot. and hot hip I knew what you meant but you said it with a rhyme I don't know why you did that <laughs> that was wrong but regardless anyway. and now also they have Kyrie Irving <laughs> Kevin Durant if it was hip <laughs> Now Jenna <laughs> said it. Your goodness. It's like you, the word. You can send it to the sticks. It's gone now. The worst. <laughs> oh, uh, it's our fault. Moving on. Hip hop. Uh, <laughs> the Celtics. <laughs> These Celtics had a void to fill when Kyrie Irving oh, decided God. to leave. That's the last time I contribute. Mm -hmm. And Kemba Walker has been tagged to fill that void. Kemba has agreed to a four-year, one hundred forty-one million dollar deal with Boston. Nick, are the Celtics better off with Kemba than they were with Kyrie? No, of course not. But And Celtics fans, stop trying to pretend you think you are. Be happy that you got Kemba, which I didn't think you'd be able to get. I didn't think the Celtics were going to get a top 10 free agent. I thought Kyrie was walking out the door. Then Horford surprisingly was walking out the door. I thought they would be piecemealing it. They got a really good player, an all-star fringe all-NBA or all-NBA this year caliber player. But he's, he's a lesser version of Kyrie Irving. We know that. But also, Kimba knew he couldn't go to the Lakers. Kimba knew he couldn't go to the Knicks. because he's that. So Boston was the spot that he had picked out, and Jordan's not going to max him out there. So great um, job by him. He deserves this contract, though. All right, moving on to the Milwaukee Bucks. They're losing Malcolm Brogdon to the Pacers, but Milwaukee will bring back Chris Middleton and Brooke Lopez. Nick, what would you make of the Bucks moves yesterday? We thought they needed to keep at least two of the three, with Middleton being the top priority. I thought they would try to keep Brogdon over Lopez, but Brogdon got a big deal, $21 million a year mm -hmm. from Indiana. Yep. This is... For the Bucs, next year is arguably the most important year in their franchise in, I don't know, 30 years. Because it is next year that they will be this time next season finding out if Giannis wants to stay long term when they can offer him that Supermax. The East is open. They couldn't afford to lose mm -hmm. two of these guys. They only lost one. But the Brogdon loss is a big one. He's a 50-40-90 guy who's been excellent for them. Potentially Toronto won't be as good. Boston's not as good. Mm -hmm. Philadelphia, potentially they're not as good. The class of the East still is Milwaukee. Big loss in losing Brogdon, but they couldn't afford to be able to pay that price that the Pacers paid. Exciting things for the Pacers with yeah. their backcourt now. All right, let's move on to Kawhi Leonard, the reigning finals MVP, the best free agent still on the market, and with many speculating he'll take his talents to the Clippers, the other L.A. team is starting to throw their name into the mix. According to reports, LeBron James will meet with Kawhi to try and woo him over to the Lakers. CC, how much responsibility is on LeBron to recruit Kawhi? How much wooing has to be done? Well, there's not because Kawhi is not contingent on one voice. So Kawhi is not demanded to be able to meet with LeBron. Um, I'm sure that 
that there are people behind the scenes that have had conversation, but there's no pressure on LeBron here. They've cleared the cap space. When Kawhi originally requested, then when he saw that San Antonio had misdiagnosed him and they weren't going to offer him the max contract that they could, he requested to be traded to the Lakers. So it just happens now that LeBron is there. It just happens now that AD is there. It just happens that they have another spot available. But a lot of free agency with Kevin Durant and other people has been about where do you want to go to work for the next four or five years? And that's what Kawhi Leonard has to build to make that decision based on one year in Canada. Do I want to go there for the next year or two? Or do I want to be back in Southern California, which he originally requested? So for me, the Lakers, when they had the cap space available, Kawhi Leonard was going to be looking at the Lakers no matter what. So there, to me, there's two points here. There's one about LeBron and then one about the Lakers and their plan. On LeBron, there's a bit of a damned if you do, damned if you don't here. If he does not recruit Kawhi Leonard, and if he, if he does not seem like he's interested in Kawhi Leonard, if he does not have open arms to it and signal things like giving his number to Anthony Davis, like telling everyone that will listen, I'm going to take more of a, back, uh, yep. not a backup role, but a lesser role than I've had in years past, then people say, why would you, what, you're going to do what Kobe did to Dwight back when Dwight was still a great player? You're, gonna, you're not going to try to get the best team around you? You're not going to try to help the Lakers win a championship? If he does recruit Kawhi Leonard, then we already know what the story is going to be. Oh, just build another super team. And by the way, I don't know if LeBron, Anthony Davis, and Kawhi is the ideal outcome for the NBA. It's obviously the ideal outcome for the Lakers. But for the NBA, if Kawhi goes anywhere other than the Lakers, a third of the league thinks they're legitimate championship contenders. But on the Lakers side of things, they clearly believe they have a real shot at Kawhi Leonard. And we know that because almost all their eggs are now in this, this basket. We can show you. I did a list of 36 free agents, top 36 guys, guys that people's names would know. We can you put did it this up. on vacation? I did, yeah, I did it on vacation. Okay. So here's the 36. The green is guys that have signed contracts. So there's Kawhi Leonard at one. Durant's gone, Kyrie's gone, Clay's gone, go down, D'Angelo Russell's gone, go over here, Vucevic is gone, Randall's gone. The next best available guy is Boogie Cousins. Then you're at Danny Green. Then you're over to the red names, which aren't great. Marcus Morris, Kelly Oubre, Jabari Parker, Seth Curry, Kevon Looney. That's your list. Those are, I just listed all of the available guys. So if you don't get Kawhi, you are then piecemealing. Now Danny Green plus Seth Curry, if you can make that work, isn't a disaster. But the Lakers clearly think they can get number one. They, they, didn't, they didn't pursue Kyrie as hard as I thought they would. They didn't pursue Kimba at all. They, they, they stayed, they, D'Angelo Russell maybe could have been gotten. They didn't do that. They, they clearly believe they can get Kawhi, see, and if they do... They're the prohibitive championship favorites, and we and they go into next season with the best big three ever, and that's why they will wait. And I think you're reporting they're going to have to wait sometime. Oh, yeah, they're going to have to wait. Kawhi's going to meet with them and the Clippers the first couple days of free agency. Then they'll take some time to figure out, is there one team more suited for Kawhi then? And if that is the case, if there is a separation, then they'll go to Toronto and have a discussion as far as Kawhi staying there in Toronto and continuing his career there. If that's for one year, two years, three years, then that would be the discussion. And then after that, Kawhi is going to make a decision. I believe that there's more pressure for LeBron more so on getting another player, especially someone who you talk about load management. This would stretch out LeBron's career, yes. if anything else, because now they got three players that if I can get two of them on the court over the course of an 82-game schedule – I can make sure that Anthony Davis in the playoffs is primed and healthy. I can make sure that LeBron makes this transition in year 17, 18, and 19. And Kawhi Leonard, we saw last year a method we had never seen on any of the great players and which led to championships. That will be the normal talk in season 19 and 20, load management. When Kevin Durant comes back, it's going to be about load management. When Clay comes Comes back, it's going to be about load management. So for me, if there's any type of pressure, if I'm LeBron James, I'm trying to get Kawhi because what it would mean for me to be able to rest 
during the regular season. You know so much about Kawhi. You've known him since he was much younger. Personality-wise, it just seems, and I could be very wrong, that he'd be a better fit for the Clippers. It's a little, you know, left of the spotlight. It's a little quieter. But what's the pitch from LeBron, if it is LeBron, to Kawhi of why he should come to the Lakers? Go ahead. How much fun was that championship? Let's go in some more. LeBron is a great teammate. Anthony Davis is a great player. This is the city you want to be in. You have proven you don't need other stars. But it's a hell of a lot easier. And I, I think Kawhi also knows we keep showing that shot in Game 7. Right. It, it, they were potentially a shot in Game 7 away from being out in the second round. I, to me, that would be the pitch, not having known Kawhi for yeah, I think that I think that something is missing here. Kawhi wants to continue to get better. And he doesn't necessarily need other players, but now it's about legacy. He got two chips. What if he gets four? Yeah. And seeing the ability to be able to play, forget LeBron. If he could just go to the Lakers and play with Anthony Davis, that would be appealing to him. Thinking that Kawhi doesn't want to be around noise just because we don't know Kawhi. I do. Kawhi wants to be in a great organization. He's going to take care of his health, and he wants to be able to play for championships, and he believes he can get better than where he is right now. So wherever he can do that, he's going to do that. And I think that's in Los Angeles compared to the Clippers. There's noise everywhere in the NBA. But let me tell you where it's really, really noisy, when you're not winning. And Kawhi wants to win championships, and this next move is about his legacy in the NBA. And it's amazing the power. A year ago, totally powerless, gets shipped to Canada, yeah. and now the whole NBA is waiting on him. Half the, almost all the free agency's done, except for the most important domino. But it's important to know, when he demanded out of San Antonio, he told Popovich, trade me to the Lakers. Pop said, I'll try to do the best I can. Where'd he send him, Nick? Toronto. Yeah. Out of the country. Out of the country. And now Kawhi gets to pick where he wants to go to work, and it might end up being in the original spot where he that he, to go. just like Kyrie. Yeah. When Kyrie wanted out of Cleveland, where'd he end up? He His, the childhood play. team, the Lakers, is the team that Kawhi grew up watching. Tomorrow on Fox, the U.S. faces red hot England in an epic semifinal clash at the FIFA Women's World Cup. Coverage begins tomorrow, 2 p.m. Eastern on Fox, or watch it live on the Fox Sports app. Oh, we're coming for the British lady's neck. Oh, England's going to have to hold that L. <laughs> oh, yeah. England's going to have to hold that L. Back here, first things first, we're joined by NBA champ up, Antoine man? Walker. He got me hype. I'm standing up in the break. I'm ready. I'm ready. Oh, got- wait, hold on. You got some new jewelry, man? Little vacation, little jewelry. Is no, this is actually my daughter. My daughter Monterey. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I was out in the street. I was at the parade yesterday, and I, I, had, I had all my bling. I was okay. It looks nice. <laughs> I like it. Shout I out like to the parade. See. Good Fox stuff. Pride. Yep, we know. Uh, the Celtics, Antoine. The Celtics <laughs> had a void to fill when Kyrie Irving decided to leave town, and Kemba Walker has been tagged to fill that void. Kemba has agreed to sign a four-year, $141 million deal with the Boston Celtics. The three-time All-Star point guard averaged a career high in points last season. Tuana, the Celtics better off with Kemba than they were with Kyrie? I believe they are. I, I, oh, I, I, come oh. on, man. Listen. No, 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 no. I believe they are. I'm going to tell you why I believe they are. First, you got to start with the locker room. I'm not going to go on the court yet, but let's just start in the locker room. You get a guy who's going to be better in the locker room, a guy who's going to bring some leadership, a guy also who's going to want to want to be there. You got to think about it. Kyrie didn't really want to be in Boston. He, he wants to be there. Obviously, it's going to be some adjusting to be made on the mm-hmm. offensive end as far as his skill. He's, he plays like Kyrie. He's a volume shooter. He's not a high percentage guy, so he needs a lot of shots to get it, get his numbers. Mm-hmm. So he's going to have to figure that out. But I think Brad Stevens learned a tremendous lesson this year on how he's going to have to deal with this team and deal with Kimball Walker fitting into this offense. I think he'll adjust the offense. I think Kimball Walker will be willing to do it. And then I like the durability. If you really look at what Kemba Walker has done the last four years. He's only missed six games. You mm. don't know what you're going to get out of Kyrie Irving as far as health-wise. But with Kemba Walker, he's going to be there. He's a couple years older. The only thing that bothers me about Kemba Walker is he hasn't played in a lot of meaningful games. Correct. And you got to take that into consideration. He hasn't played in the playoff games that Kyrie Irving's played in. Obviously, we saw Kyrie do it on the biggest stage in the world, make one of the biggest shots for the Cleveland Cavaliers and winning them a championship. Mm -hmm. But I like Kemba Walker to replace them. They couldn't find no better fit to me in the league to be able to get him right in. And I just think 
Everything total package off the court, on the court, he's better than Kyrie. Okay. I, you made several points that I got to get to because I think they're, they're very, very good points as far as to, to what you're trying to say. Number one, Brad Stevens. What did he learn last year? Mm -hmm. We think Brad's a good coach. But that experience last year and the limited things they did offensively. They didn't have a whole bunch of flexibility offensively. So, yes, when you are with a legendary franchise, the buy-in, especially if you're on a one- or two-year deal, that buy-in is if I'm going to be here, I'm going to spend all my time here, that does go into the other players as far as other guys feeling comfortable. Because whenever you make a decision, those players will base it off of Oh, he's going to be here. So it's just not going to be coming off the court. When Kyrie said, oh, we lack maturity, oh, we, the youth, that's, that's killing us, the inexperience. See, that right there, and you don't know if you're going to be there, that hurts the other players. And the last thing as far as we know that he's going to need his shots. We know that he's going to, but he is going to be on the court. So I do like those things. But what I hate in sports is I hate when we lose a star player and – I faced this myself. I remember the draft after I decided to retire. And they asked some of the Vikings players, well, what about the offense? You guys have been one of the top offenses. And one of the prominent players, I'm not going to mention his name, he said, oh, I think we'll be better without Chris Carter. And I just see this every time after this. Kevin Durant, what about the Warriors? They're going to be better. Every time in sports when you lose a player, the next question is, will they be better? What about will they reach the level that they were at before they got Kyrie, and because last year was not, can they get back to where they were two years ago? I just think expectations when you lose great players, they aren't real. I do like Kimba playing there, but a lot of this is up to Brad Stevens, Nick. Okay, so two things. One is they, they also lost Al Horford. But let's just throw that out. Let's just make this just about Kimba versus Kyrie because let's. It's, Al Horford left. He got a great deal with Philly. We understand it. So the loss of Al Horford is enormous. But let's. And if Al this. Horford was there, based on his pick and pop style, him and Kimba would be a great pair. Right, but I can re remove that and just have a Kimba versus Kyrie discussion. I would understand the argument that even if a player is a slightly inferior player to another guy, a team could be better with him. So let's say. For instance, if the Celtics had acquired Mike Conley, Mike Conley is not as good as Kyrie Irving. But when some of the issue was young guys not getting enough shots, veteran leadership, someone who's led a young team before, he checks so many of those boxes, you might say, oh, maybe they'll be better. But Kimba, a player I like a ton, who is coming off the best year of his career, is a lesser version of Kyrie. He's smaller than Kyrie. He's a slightly worse defender than Kyrie. He is a worse, he is a slightly worse offensive player than Kyrie. I don't know. You, I, no, two parts you're wrong. Mike Conley, not an all-star. Let's not ever mention him in the category with all-star. Okay, that, that, fine. So, he, Mike he's Conley not an all-star, so he's just a nice, example. nice good player, a good, good player. He'll be fine. But when you talk, it's not that far <laughs> off between Kimber Walker and Kyrie Irving. Oh, it's not that far. And let's look at the body of work. See, I think because he hasn't played on the big stage, mm -hmm. you're taking that away from him. He is the real deal. He's gotten better and better every year of the last four years. He hasn't played with the same talent that Kyrie Irving's played with. And let's give him a chance to see what happens. Uh, I agree. I, listen, I, I, I want to, because I'm not going to be a hypocrite on this. I thought Kimba would have been an excellent fit with the Lakers. I like Kimba a ton, but I don't think he's a better player than Kyrie Irving. Well, and if the problem was, one of the problems wasn't just that Kyrie is aloof and kind an odd guy. It was his style and whether or not it fed to the development of Tatum and Brown. Kimba has the same style as Kyrie does, just a slightly less efficient version of it. I would agree with you, Don. That's why they're not far off. I believe it is. They do got the same type of style. They're both valiant shoes. Kyrie's a little bit more efficient. But Kimber Walker's right there. He's gotten better over the four years as far as developing his jump shot. He's a great free throw shooter. They're both a low assist guys. They don't make yep. necessarily make other players better. Um, they both need 20 shots to get their number, right. so mm -hmm. they, they're, they're close. But did Kemba even have anyone else around him? Wouldn't, didn't Kemba, isn't there something to the fact that Kemba sort of had to take just, all those shots there in Charlotte? No, he, he, didn't, he, he hasn't had a great team around him, and that's no. why he hasn't had the big playoff games. I think he's been in the playoffs twice yep. um, in his Out career. In the first round both. Yeah, so I, he hasn't had the opportunity to put be on the big stage, and that, that hurts him a little bit when you get into Kyrie and obviously Kemba Walker talk, but they're not far off, believe me, and, you, and I think Kemba Walker's going to prove that this year. If you look at Kyrie what he's done in Boston. He didn't do much. That run that the Celtics made was without him. Mm -hmm. Last year, they won 49 games. They underachieved. 
They, they supposed to got to the – we had them getting to the finals last year. With LeBron was his best years. Before LeBron, he didn't do anything. So you got to think about it. Kimball Walker is going to get an opportunity to take this young group that's going to be a little older, a little better. Obviously, I think the absence of Al Horford and Terry Rozier mm-hmm. are going to hurt because you have to replace those guys with somebody. I don't know who, those, who they're going to be able to replace them with, but you, I think that hurt more than them losing Kyrie. Irving. One thing, too, I just don't want you guys to miss because I, I know how these things happen. The Celtics end up having a a better than what we expect because our expectations will be lower. They'll end up playing better. And you know what? People will give Kimba all the credit. But we won't look at Jalen Brown. We won't look at Tatum because they're responsible too. Like these guys got to grow up. Like these guys got to be assume more of that leadership. And I just believe they'll like Kimba more and they will work it out because all three of those players need shots. But just watch how this goes. Now we'll start to give Kimba all the credit when a lot of the responsibility, we talked about Brad Stevens and the other players. They have to be bought in to Kimba being their team leader. And, and, but how many in the playoffs? In what series will the Celtics have the best player? Against Milwaukee, no. Against the Nets, no. Against Philly, no. I mean, you're going to have to go down the list till you find a playoff series where against or against Indiana, maybe. Like, where you find a series where Boston will have the best player. That's a problem. Uh, moving on to the Brooklyn Nets now. They just two seasons ago were the laughing stock of the league, Antoine. Now they boast arguably the highest stock in the league, Antoine. Reported landing two of the hottest free agents on the market in Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. KD will most likely sit out next season rehabbing that Achilles injury, but the Nets also reportedly get DeAndre Jordan. So good times in Boston. Antoine, what was your reaction to the move? I like it. I mean, you, you can, anytime you can add two top ten players, obviously Kevin Durant has to get back healthy. But this is unbelievable for Brooklyn. It puts them right in the top of the Eastern Conference. Probably not this year, but next year you figure Philly, them. Um, Milwaukee. Milwaukee. Mm-hmm. Maybe Indiana. I like Indiana's mm-hmm. moves. They've improved yep. their roster over free agency over the last 24 hours. So they're right in the mix. And then obviously if Kevin Durant comes back, at 95% of where he's, where he's at, they're going to be really good and be a title contender. So this is a great move. And I think these two guys complement each other. I mean, I know that everybody talks about their friendship being very close, but I think um, it keeps – Kyrie Irving goes back to that not being a, the man and it kind of goes to Kevin Durant mm-hmm. where he, he, was really, he was really good with LeBron James and kind of being in that 1B role. It takes him out that 1A role. Um, I think Kevin Durant had no other choice but to join up with another superstar, it just didn't make sense for him to leave Golden State if he wasn't going to play with another superstar and have title hopes and contention. So um, great move for both of these guys. They get an opportunity to play together for a couple years. And then the Eastern Conference, where they're going to have a legitimate shot to um, get out the East. This is obviously the story of the day, an enormous coup for Brooklyn, and a lesson for li- – there's two different NBAs. There's the NBA that you have to live in if you're in Utah – If you're in Milwaukee, if you're in Indiana, if you're in one of these places that historically has never been a free agent destination, you got to do it smart, you got to do it the hard way, you got to have some luck, and you got to take some time. And you need to keep your draft picks, you need to keep being nimble. If you are in a major marquee destination, what you need is a little bit of infrastructure, a little bit of wise management, and what is overrated are young players and future picks. What Brooklyn saw was we dug ourselves out of this hell in the KG Pierce trade. We saw the writing on the wall that this was possible, so we will trade future picks just to get off Alan Crabb's contract, so this is a possibility, and we will bet on ourselves and now they have a guy who was looking like he might soon become the best player in the world in Kevin Durant until he popped his Achilles until he strained his calf and then popped his Achilles and a guy in Kyrie Irving who we know if he's your second best player you can win a title we're not guessing that we know that that's the case and for them to do it and to steal this right from out from underneath the New York Knicks, what the Knicks' plan had been for a year. The Knicks didn't give up Alan Crabb and a couple first-round picks. They gave up Chris Tapps Porzingis okay. in order to make this a reality for them. It is. It even adds to the bounty it is for Brooklyn. Well, this is the way it happened. And uh, even in communicating with people this morning, the New York Knicks never even got an opportunity to offer Kevin Durant the max contract. But Kevin Durant started looking at other places. And that was either go back to Golden State for that $80 million because we have never seen 
someone turned down $80 million. So we knew Golden State was going to be part of the picture. But the New York Knicks were not in on Kyrie. KD and Kyrie wanted to play together. That wasn't going to be a possibility. They did have um, uh, they did have DeAndre Jordan trying to work, trying to convince Kyrie and KD to be able to come to New York. That didn't work. That's why he DeAndre joined them in Brooklyn. But the Knicks didn't get the opportunity because they weren't in on Kyrie. Kyrie and KD were saying they wanted to play together, so it ended up falling into the lap of the Nets, who ends up, who they end up clearing the cap space, so they end up able to grab Kevin Durant. So as far as free agency, they had their guy in Kyrie, but they cleared the space in case there would be another guy, and Kyrie told them that Kevin Durant could potentially be coming. So you have to give Sean Marks and that organization, because in over three years, since he has Man, totally revamped that roster, revamped that organization, the coaching staff, and the overall chemistry that they have going on. Like, they pulled off the biggest coup in free agency in securing Kevin Durant. Now, people used to talk about, they did here in the paper, the Mecca of basketball. They talk about New York. No, no, the Mecca of basketball right now yeah, is, is in Brooklyn, yes. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, why do you think the Knicks were so down on Kyrie? I think some things they're worried about is overall health. They're worried about some things off the court. They're worried about his commitment to taking care of his body. And they wanted a real answer to what happened there in Boston. And there wasn't a legitimate answer for them. So they were concerned about having Kyrie in their locker room with their younger players. I think also we gotta, you got to add to it. It's great to be able to play with your friend. I don't know where their friendship is at. It seems like it's very strong. But in a year from now, it will be tested. Yep. Um, the, the, the expectations go up. Um, you're going to have to have to deal with the media. Neither one of these guys are great dealing with the media. Um, the losses, you lose a few games here and there. Can they go at each other? And Chris, you know what I'm talking about. Can they go at each other? Right. Can they push each other to the max? When mm. things ain't going well, can they scream at you? Those are real the, questions. Those are things that the, may be the only concerns that you're going to have to deal with them. And obviously, Brooklyn will continue to put good pieces around them. But when it gets tight... That's what I want to see because these are two different type of personalities, two guys that are, you know, at times have been very sensitive in different areas. And there's two tiers here. How could could they be next year, and how good could they be once KD's playing? Listen, and if, if KD gets back to being Kevin Durant and Kyrie's knees don't flare up on him, of course they can win a championship. Now, not this year because KD. I would be shocked if KD plays at all this year. Maybe KD has a fast recovery, and they're in the playoffs. And but let's just throw this year out. Then in 2021, they could be they could win the title. That's how good they could be. That's what this move's all about. But there is an enormous responsibility on Kyrie Irving this season. Brooklyn is a feel-good story. Brooklyn has in so much positive momentum. All these young guys, they didn't have to trade for K KD or Kyrie. I mean, they lose D'Angelo Russell, right. obviously, but they have all, all those young pieces coming back. Kyrie's got to keep that going this year. He's got to be a better leader than he was in Boston. He's got to be a better culture guy than he was in Boston. And for both KD and Kyrie, they also, when it comes to, and I think a lot of the media stuff's overrated, but those guys were mad all year, both independently, that the media would not stop asking them about playing with each other. They both acted like it was nonsense, noise, we were making it up. We weren't making it up. It was all real. And so now that it's happening, how will they both deal with that together? Will they realize, all right, it's time to mature and show the young players how to do it? Or will they double down on it now that they're together? That's something interesting to watch as well. And you've been laughing at me say this for the last couple of months. See, you know this. The media in New York is a beast. And these two guys just don't like it. So I think yeah. you're in for it. A I got $300 million, though. So, <laughs> I mean, how tough can y'all be? Thank you for listening to the First Things First podcast. Remember, leave us a review and tell us what you think. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts and catch us on FS1 Monday through Friday, 6.30 a.m. Eastern. For Chris Carter and Nick Wright, I'm Jenna Wolf. So long, everybody.